Hey, Walter Sorrells back with more tips for the knife maker. Today, everything you ever wanted to know about drill bits. First, it's not a drill bit, it's a drill. That's what machinists say. Personally, I do not care. There's a point here though. There are a lot of different kinds of drills. Before we start getting into the details though, quick warning, I generally make videos intended to give you immediate practical information. Today though, we're kind of nerding out on background information that will broaden your general knowledge rather than giving you a bunch of practical tips. So, let's get started. The oldest type of drill in the world is the spade drill. You can see variants of this design going back thousands of years. The problem with spade drills is that the chips tend to pack into the holes and the drill has to be pulled out regularly so that the hole can be cleaned out. You can still buy them. Also, if you need a weird size hole, they're pretty easy to make. Why use a spade drill? They're actually more rigid than twist drills the metal working type is anyway, and can be much cheaper, especially when drilling large holes. You also have a second type of spade drill, this one made mostly for woodworking. A drill like this will get trashed in steel or other hard materials, but when drilling wood, they'll save you gazillions of bucks over extremely large twist drills. Which leads us to this. The most common type of drill is this, the twist drill. Go down to Harbor Freight, this is what you'll find hanging in the drill bit section. Drills are made to fairly accurate standards. They can be found in both metric and inch, also known as imperial, diameters. Imperial drills are typically sold in fractional sizes, quarter inch, 5 sixteenths, 11 sixty-fourths, whatever. But they also come in number sizes, also known as wire sizes, and letter sizes too. Numbers are smaller, letters are bigger. Typically letter and number or wire sizes are specialized drills used for, say, thread tapping or where you want a fairly accurate hole that doesn't correspond exactly to a fractional or standard metric size. For instance, if you want to tap a hole to accept a quarter 20 thread, you'll need a drill with a diameter of 201 thousandths of an inch. Now that's not a standard fractional size. So what you need is a number seven drill. An important thing to understand with respect to sizes though is this. Just because you have a drill that's accurate to half a thousandth of an inch doesn't mean that your hole will be exactly that size. In fact, it definitely will not. It'll be bigger. More on that later. Twist drills are typically sold in three sizes screw machine length, which are shorter and more rigid, jobber length, which is your typical Home Depot drill size, and aircraft length, which are ultra long. Just a quick note, if you need anything other than your typical Home Depot fractional twist drill, you can find nearly infinite types of drills from places like Granger, McMaster Car, and MSC, as well, of course, as on eBay. Taps are typically sold in pairs with a drill bit, often a non-fractional size, that fits that tap. And you can generally find these at places like Home Depot. So, let's look at the geometry of the twist drill. This part is known as the shank. These are the flutes. The basic idea of the twist drill is that a helical flute is ground into the shaft. The flutes allow chips to exit from the cutting edge and work their way all the way out of the hole so that the bit doesn't bind up in the hole. If you didn't have flutes, the chips would pack into the hole causing the drill to bind and very likely snap. Now to the tip. The cutting edge is here. It's relieved, meaning that the edge slopes away from the material being cut. Too much relief and that edge is going to chip easily, not enough, and the backside will rub on your material, causing the tool to overheat and eventually fail. The cutting edge also slopes away from the center point. Not all drills have exactly the same point geometry. The typical twist drill from Lowe's has a 118 degree angle, but special purpose drills have other angles. The harder the material that you're drilling, the greater you want that angle to be. 
So specialized drills made for, say, plastic will often be fairly pointy, whereas drills made for hardened and stainless steel will often have an edge angle closer to 135 degrees. Again, not something you'll find at Lowe's, but readily available from the big industrial supply places like MSC. The material in the middle holding the drill together is known as the web. More web equals a stronger drill. Unfortunately, it also means that the tip is thicker and therefore harder to drive into the material. The tip or point here can be ground in various ways, especially for drilling hard materials. A split point is handy because it allows you to cut right smack down to the point, whereas a conventional grind has to just jam that dull point right down into the material. This also makes the split point less likely to walk than conventional points. Notice how the point skitters around here before it ultimately enters slightly deflected, therefore making for a non-square hull. So the conventional point tends to be fine for wood or plastic, but not so great for a metal. Split points, on the other hand, cost a little more. Another type of drill is the spotting drill. The most common are these little combo countersinks and spotting drills. They're very short and therefore nice and rigid. They're often used in lathe work, but can be used anytime you want to drill a very accurate starter hole before switching to a longer or wider drill. Spot first. Switch to another drill. Boom, you got a perfectly located hole. This is a second type of spotting drill. It has a sharp point and very short flutes, as well as being short and rigid so that it'll stay true when engaging. They're commonly used in CNC and mill operations, but they're very useful for anybody who needs to drill accurately located holes. Folder makers, for instance. This is a reamer. As I mentioned earlier, drills don't drill holes exactly the size of the drill body or its nominal diameter. There's always some tool deflection, some chips coming out, some rubbing, some wandering of the tip as it enters the work, any or all of which can cause the hole to enlarge slightly. In most applications, clearance holes for a bolt or that sort of thing, who cares? But if you need a precision hole, you got to have a reamer. The idea with the reamer is that you drill a hole just a hair under the desired size. Then you use a reamer, often extremely accurately ground to within a few ten thousandths of nominal, to bring the hole to final size. Typically they have straight flutes and are run slowly and in one single clean pass. This way the chips don't wreck the hole and the reamer runs very true, leaving a nice, clean, accurate hole. If you make folding knives, a reamer is a must for pivot holes, allowing you to make really tight slip fits for the pivot so that the knife has nice smooth action and zero play. Okay, there are lots more specialized drills. Masonry drills with brazed carbide tips, gun drills, drills with replaceable carbide inserts, and so on and so on. We'll skip these, however, because they aren't really relevant to the average knife maker. Let's turn to performance. The biggest issue that drills face is heat. All the friction involved in drilling causes the tip to heat up, and eventually that will cause the tip to soften, which will then cause the drill to fail. Around 1900, metallurgists at Bethlehem Steel came up with what's known as high-speed steel, a family of heavily alloyed steels containing tungsten, molybdenum, chromium, vanadium, and cobalt. This was a huge advance in drilling, allowing drills to run faster, hotter, and longer. Today, most of the cheaper grade drills are made from high-speed steel. Another steel, referred to as cobalt, holds up better under heat than high-speed steel. Now, technically, cobalt steel is actually part of the high-speed steel family, but as a practical matter, drills are sold as high-speed steel or as cobalt. If you only drill soft stuff like wood and plastic, high-speed steel's fine. But if you ever drill steel, which all knife makers do, I would highly recommend using cobalt drills. 
They're slightly more expensive, but they last way longer, so they save you money in the long run. Cobalt can be distinguished from high-speed steel by its slight gold tint. This drill is made from carbide. Carbide, actually tungsten carbide, is an insanely hard and heat-resistant material. The cheapest carbide drills generally cost about five times cobalt and ten times high-speed steel. Here's the thing about carbide, though. It's the only thing that will drill hardened steel. So if you screw up and harden the tang of a knife, you gotta have carbide. If you drill tons and tons of, say, quarter inch holes in the tangs of your knives, you might actually save money by buying a quarter inch carbide drill for, say, 25 bucks, and then getting 20 times the use out of it that you'd get out of your $6 cobalt drill. Okay, last topic, then we'll wrap up. Many modern drills feature coatings intended to improve the performance and life of the tool. Titanium nitride, black oxide, aluminum titanium nitride, titanium aluminum nitride, not the same thing by the way, zirconium nitride, and so on. First, it's important to understand that these are just very thin coatings and they do wear off after a while. Titanium nitride is recognizable by its bright gold color, much brighter than cobalt, whereas black oxide obviously is black. Black oxide is typically a little cheaper than titanium nitride. In theory, titanium nitride holds up better to harder materials like steel than black oxide, which is better suited to softer materials. But honestly, I don't know that the average knife maker would see much difference in typical knife making applications. Other coatings you'll see are aluminum titanium nitride and titanium aluminum nitride, as well as CBN, zirconium nitride, and some other things. These are very pricey and tend to be more useful for carbide tools in industrial type applications. I use aluminum titanium nitride coated carbide end mills in my CNC mill, for instance, but I would not bother with them for a drill press or even a manual mill. They have fairly narrow working envelopes where their advantages are substantial, but to give an example, if you're not running aluminum titanium nitride at at least 800 degrees Fahrenheit, there's supposedly no particular advantage over uncoated tools. So to wrap up, my advice for knife makers is as follows. I'd buy a super cheap set of drills in all the normal fractional sizes and keep them as a backup. For normal drilling tasks that are repeated frequently in your shop though, I would get a quarter inch, eighth, sixteenth, whatever you drill frequently, and I'd recommend cobalt for that. Keep spares around and ditch your drills when they get dull. Early in my knife making career, I tried to drill way too often with dull drills. Would I invest in carbide as a beginning knife maker? No, but it's handy to have a few common diameters around, especially in the event of running into hardened steel. Speaking of which, when steel deforms, it gets harder. This is called work hardening. 1095, for instance, is particularly notorious for this. You're drilling a hole, suddenly the drill starts making all kinds of awful noises, and it just bogs down and you have to stop. Keep trying and your drill starts glowing and bye-bye drill bit. A sharp bit, run at a correct speed and feed rate, will get you around this problem. Being too timid, quitting in the middle of holes, or running at too high a speed will cause blade steel to work harden at which point your drill's toast. So if you ever run into the situation where a hole work hardens or where you unintentionally harden the tang of a knife, carbide will get you out of trouble. Okay, hope you enjoyed that. Thanks for watching and see you soon. Thanks for watching guys. If you like what we're doing here, please subscribe and make sure that you click on that bell so you get notified of all the latest videos. Want to buy a knife from me? Check out my modern blades at tacticsarmory.com. 
digging the channel you can support our video making efforts on patreon you know i've been banging away on these videos for like 10 years so i hope you'll show some love for all that hard work link in the cards and descriptions finally if you're interested in making japanese swords check out my full line of japanese sword videos where i show how to forge japanese swords as well as how to polish them and how to make fittings handles and scabbards walter sorrels blades dot com.